if you've got a, a Bible there, can you just turn uh, real quickly to Acts chapter 2? We can get started on this. Um, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit the last few weeks, and we're going to continue to talk about the Holy Spirit in the coming weeks and different aspects of that. Um, I, I really feel, uh, uh, in, in my, I guess, in my uh, uh, spirit, I shared a message last week, um, uh, last Sunday night I was speaking at the Combined Churches service and I was going to preach that same message this morning but I'm not going to, I'll, I'll, I'm going to share it. But I had this word on my heart and I, I shared it on Sunday night, uh, I don't know if anyone was there, might have been a couple of people there and afterwards um, I actually had uh, some other pastors come up to me and they felt like it was uh, a prophetic word for uh, this area and the believers in our region and I kind of felt that too. But it's all really come out of what we're talking about here in terms of the Holy Spirit. So um, I, I feel like God is wanting to stir up some things in our hearts. Amen. I, I feel like God's wanting to, to stir up uh, the Holy Spirit in us. Um, the, the, the Christian religion is not a religion. It's not about following a rule book. It's not about getting this and studying the notes and finding out all the right things to do. And It's not about that. It's a, in, in the same way that these 12 disciples we read about, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, in those gospel accounts, that, that the same way that these men physically walked with a dude called Jesus and interacted with him and, and had encounters with him and experience with him, that's the picture that we have in the New Testament of the church. When Jesus said, uh, I'm going to go, but I won't leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send another one. But this one's not going to come in a physical body like I did. This will be the Spirit that will come and use your physical body. So the Spirit will come and indwell you. And so wherever you are, you take the Holy Spirit with you. Wherever you go, He's there the decisions you're making, the problems you're facing, the burdens you're carrying, the pressures, there's this, the, the very Spirit of God, if we believe what these writers said, the very Spirit of God has been given to us and journeys through life with us. So the Holy Spirit is not a topic that should be studied. The Holy Spirit is not a doctrine to be worked out. The Holy Spirit is literally a person to be experienced in the same way that Jesus was a person who real people had experiences with. If you go through the book of Acts and you read, now the book of Acts is the first 30 years of church history. If you go through and you read it, one thing is painfully obvious to me, and that is that when the Holy Spirit comes to a person and fills a person, that their life experience from that point on has the potential, can be and should be different than it was before the Spirit came. So our life with God should be different than it was before God. Before I came to God, I was, uh, uh, let me you know, use religious biblical terms, I guess I was a slave to sin. In other words, there were these impulses and compulsions, things that I just did. Some of them I talked about before. I just went with culture. I just went with the value system of my, my crew, my group, or I just went with my own desires and emotions, many of which were birthed out of dysfunctional things in my life, hurts, pains, bitterness, loss, and so on, that created this unhealthy desire for things that I thought would, this would fill it. Really, I was always searching for God. I just didn't know it, but I chased after these things, and once upon a time, I was kind of a slave, just given over to it. It took incredible willpower and and self-control to try to stop myself from doing things that were hurting me and, and disruptive to a good life. But I just kept doing them anyway. Anyone relate to that? I just kept doing them anyway. Even though I knew a lot of the stuff I did was not good, but I just kept doing it. Uh, it's like Paul says in Romans, he says, the thing that I don't want to do, I do it. And the thing I do want to do, I don't do it. I've got this battle raging on the inside. Anyone relate to that? The thing I know is right to do. To, I know that I should forgive that person. But the thing I want to do, I don't do. I know I'm not forgiving them, even though I want to, but I'm not forgiving them. And then the thing I do want to do, which is forgive, I'm not doing. The thing I don't want to do, which is not forgive them, that's what I'm doing. It just is crazy. But life can be like that when we're trying to exercise our own self-control and it's all about us. But Paul, when he goes through this, the thing I don't want to do, I do do so he almost like he throws his hands and he goes, oh, what's the, what's the point? But then he finishes by saying, but praise be to God who sets us free. And you see, I think since the Holy Spirit came into my world, here's the way I look at it in simple terms. When the Holy Spirit entered my world, do I still have moments and still have a compulsion to want to do the wrong thing? Yes, I do. 
There are still things in my life as I'm a disciple and I'm outworking the, the different hurts and the disruptions and the things that have happened to me and a better view of life. There are still certain passions and desires that want to pull me over there. But now I have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of me. And the Holy Spirit is the one that gives me the power and the capacity and the ability to say yes to the things I want to do and say no to the things I don't want to do. Without the Spirit, I can't do that. But with the Spirit, I can. So it is possible to live a Christian life that is victorious. It's possible to live a Christian life where we win. It's possible to live a Christian life where we climb up above things. It's possible, but it's only possible because of the indwelling Holy Spirit in our life. And every person in this room, if you have bowed your knee to Jesus, if you have repented of your own way of doing things and humbly accepted that you got it wrong and Jesus died for you and made the decision, repentance, remember, means a 180 turn away. It's changing the way we think. It's not just praying a prayer and going back and doing it again tomorrow. It's actually going, that was wrong. I'm now agreeing with you, God. You say this way? Okay, I'm going to go that way, God. And if you've done that, then you have the Holy Spirit, which means that you have this incredible resource available on the inside of you that can make the future look different to the past. It can give you a better future and a different future than what you have had in the past. Who believes that? I believe that. That's what Jesus talked about. That's why Jesus didn't, he wasn't perturbed about the disciples and leaving them alone, going, oh, what's going to happen to them? These, these hillbillies are going to fall away from me. I can already see it. Peter thinks he loves me, but he's going to deny me. The others are going to scatter when a guy comes after me and Judas drags me away. And they go, I know what's going to happen. Oh, no. He said, I'm not worried at all because you think it was good with me. Man, it's going to be way better when I go and I send the Spirit. It's going to be way better when the Holy Spirit comes. Uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 1, I love the way that Luke starts this account of the first 30 years of church history. Luke 1.1, 1, 1, he says the former account, I'm a, keep in mind these, were, these things were actually letters that were written for a purpose. Did you know that? And if you read these, 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 these 66 ancient historical documents that have been brought together that we call a Bible, if you read them, the authors actually give us some insight into there was a reason why I wrote this. I didn't just sit down and go, ooh, by the Spirit, ooh, ooh, there's a document. They had reasons. And, and, and so Luke starts the first 30 years of church history and tells us, I'm writing to a guy called Theophilus. He says, the former account I made, oh, excellent Theophilus. So he wrote the book of Luke and he wrote it for a guy called Theophilus because he wanted this guy to understand the story of Jesus. Just so happens that the Holy Spirit went, nah, there's a bigger plan for that document. Let's make sure that for, the, for thousands of years until I return, that my, my people have a copy of those incidents, those actions, those things. So in Acts 1.1, he says, the former account I made, excellent Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. I love that. It's probably my favorite verse in the entire collection of ancient documents, that one verse, Acts 1.1. You'll probably never hear another human being say that's their favorite verse, but it is definitely mine. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and teach. He didn't say all that Jesus did and taught. He didn't put a full stop on the work of Jesus. He didn't put a full stop there. He put a comma. He said, I wrote this volume called Luke, and that's what Jesus began to do. Comma, now I'm going to show you what Jesus is still doing through the lives of those that have bowed their knees to him. Isn't that exciting? And the book of Acts, by the way, at the very end, doesn't have a full stop. It's got another comma. And they didn't write it because you and me are writing it with our very lives as living sacrifices every single day. So the book of Acts is still going on. You're writing in its pages with your choices, your decisions, and the way you live your life. You're a living, I think Paul writes it this way, you're a living epistle, a living letter. You're a living letter. Isn't that awesome? So we need to, to, to give some, some, some thought to and some attention to the Holy Spirit. Not because the Holy Spirit's sitting in the corner going, oh, nobody ever talks about me. They talk about God all the time and Jesus. Woo Nothing to do with that. But because right now, the presence of God down here on earth is in the form of the Holy Spirit, according to Jesus. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, Father seated on the throne, the whole Trinity thing, and I don't want to get into the Trinity, people wig out about it, but Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you can take this thing called H2O, you can stick it in a cup and put it in a, in a freezer and it turns into ice. You can take it out, leave it in the sink, it'll melt, it'll turn into liquid water. Then you can put it on a stove, turn up the heat, it'll turn into steam. It's H2O, same thing, three different forms. The concept of Trinity is not that weird. 
It's just not that weird. Okay, Same substance, different forms. But right now, it's the Holy Spirit that's present with us. And here's what I want you to, to see. I want you to see. I want everyone to walk away this morning knowing this. I have within me the Holy Spirit. I want, no, I, I, I want everyone to know that. Because I think one of the ways that, that we don't live this victorious Christian life, one of the ways that we're being robbed and the church in general is being robbed, not only of your own personal walk with God being robbed, but the witness of the church in general to the world around us, one of the ways that we're being robbed is because the devil is convincing us that we don't, we probably, he's making a second guess. I'm not sure. I mean, I had a moment and I thought, and then, oh, no, no maybe I don't. Or maybe we're sitting there going, look, no, look I, you know what, I really, poor worth. Now, I just believe Paul Worth's filled with the Spirit. I can just tell. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. And, 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 yeah, but I'm not like Paul Worth, so maybe not for me. You know, maybe it's for Jackie. Jackie, I can tell that Jackie is. And, and yeah, maybe Del. Del's been around long enough. She's had a few drinks of the Spirit. She knows. She's got plenty of runs on the board. That's Del. You know, I, got all, I, can, I, can believe, I can believe that the person on the left of me and the person on the right of me is filled with the Holy Spirit. I can believe that they could lay their hands on the sick and maybe see a miracle. I could believe that when they pray, God listens. I could believe that God could give them wisdom wisdom in their situation. I believe God could speak to them about what they're going through. I believe that God could give a solution to their trouble right now, but I don't know about me. I don't know about me. And so what I want out of today is for you to see biblically that you do have the Holy Spirit. If you have repented and turned around and given your life to Christ, I want you to walk out of this room today. I want you to high five someone before you go and I want you to believe in your heart, I have the Holy Spirit. Because if you believe that, that changes everything about the Christian life. It changes everything. Now, here's, 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 just let me throw some, some scriptures at you that to me make it very clear about, why, about all believers being filled with the Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 39. I think Luke's going to put these up for you. I've got a lot of scriptures to get through, so I'm just going to fire through. Now, when they heard this, this is the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has fallen upon the believers. And it says that those believers, uh, that they, they spoke in other languages, is what it says. And, and, and don't get caught up on that, because I'm coming back to that. I'm going to come back. I just want you to see what I'm trying to say here. It goes on, it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? This is after they've heard the story of Jesus. And Peter says this, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And if you do that, you, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Everyone say to you, thanks Jackie, and to your children, and say your children's children, and your grandchildren, and your great great grandchildren, and your great 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 grandchildren, and your great great I could keep on going all day. You get the point. He's saying it doesn't matter. There's no full stop at the end of that sentence. This is for you, the next generation, next gen, next as many as God would call, as many as would repent and put their faith in me. This is a promise. You will receive the Holy Spirit. So if you're in this room and you've repented, turned away from your old life and you're living for Jesus, here's what he's saying, then you have been a recipient of that promise. Amen? Do you believe that today? You're a recipient of that promise. Paul writes this to the Ephesians in Ephesians 2.13. He says, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Isn't that a great thought? We're all one body. You know, that's kind of weird, isn't it, really? We're one body, you know? All churches, all denominations, all backgrounds, we've been baptized by one spirit, immersed into one spirit is what it means. Baptized means immersed. We've been immersed into the one spirit and we're now one body. One body. Isn't that, that that's a great thought. That means that the, 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 the denomination down the road that I might have a difference of opinion on on certain doctrines, guess what? They're still my brother. If they've repented and believe in Jesus and his sacrament, they're still my brother, they're still my sister. So be careful what we say about our own family members. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, you have all been made to drink into one spirit. Okay? So one spirit, we've all been baptized into one spirit. Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now watch this second bit. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. In other words, it's impossible, it's impossible to be born again and not have the spirit. So if you're sitting here saying, I'm born again, then at the same time, you're admitting, I have the Holy Spirit. You can't sit here and say, I've got, this, I've got the Spirit, but I'm not born again. It doesn't work like that. You can't sit here and say, I'm born again, but I don't have the Spirit. You do have the Spirit. 
Now again, we're going to spend a, a, a bit of time going over this. Not all today, so don't race ahead of us. Yes, there's one, there's one spirit. Yes, there are many different fillings of that spirit. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. What I want you to admit and accept today and start living out the minute you walk out the door is the fact that you have the Holy Spirit now. Stop waiting for something else to happen unless you have not repented and given your life to Christ. If you have, you have the Spirit now. If, you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. This is what Paul writes to the Romans. Now, here's the thing. The devil wants us to be constantly second-guessing the presence of the Spirit in our life because without the Spirit, the Christian life is as powerless as any other life. And that's the truth. It's as powerless as any other life. You are simply relying on your own willpower. And I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot. <laughs> if it's willpower, then I'll tell you what, I'll be the best at working in my garden, watching the football. I'll be the best at it. I'll be the best at not praying, at not reading the Bible. I'll be the best at not coming to gatherings. I'll be the best at all that because my natural will doesn't incline me to all those things. You see? But through the Spirit, I can make the choices to do the things that I want to do and start avoiding the things I don't want to do and actually enter into this Christian experience to its fullness. I can enter into it not just as a person who's adhering to a religious set of values and worldview, but as a person that's walking daily with a living spirit, the very spirit of God himself inside of me. That's the Christian experience. That's the Christian life. You know, some years back, um, we, we lived in Pasco. Remember that house in Pasco Street in Brisbane? And when we were living in this <coughs> house in Pasco Street in uh, the northern suburbs of Brisbane, we um, uh, we, we moved, we were there for, uh, I don't know, a year or a year and a half, something like that. How many? About a year and a half. We moved down to there. And we, fast forward, we ended up down here in Ballina. We're living in Ballina. One day, the phone rings and Jackie answers the phone. And Jackie can clarify the amount. So I don't remember the amount. What was the amount they said? Was it about a million? <laughs> hey? It was about a million, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a million. So here's the story. She gets this phone call. She picks up the phone. Hello. Are you Jackie? Uh, yep. Did you used to live in, in whatever it was, 709 Pasco Street? Yes, I did. Um, this is the federal police. Whoa. Were you aware? <laughs> were you aware that there were $1 million of casino chips in the roof of your house? Now, if I had answered that phone, I would have said, do you think I'd be renting and driving a second-hand carry if I knew that? <laughs> of course not. We didn't know that. Here we were living in this house and literally I could have touched it. Above my head was a million dollars in casino chips right there. I'm under the roof. It's there with me. And I didn't know. I didn't know. Now, because I didn't know, I couldn't benefit from anything those chips could have given me or brought into my life. I felt like such a dummy. All I had to do was pop up in the manhole and... Oh! Jackie'd be like, where'd you get that pair of shoes? Oh, saved up. <laughs> where'd you get the car? Oh, it was a gift. How far could I have taken that on? <laughs> I had this incredible wealth and we were living under the same roof as this incredible wealth, but we didn't know it was there and it didn't benefit us at all. And unfortunately, that's the story of too many Christians. We're living with the very presence of God under our roof inside of us the spirit of God with us but we're still living as if it's all up to us we're still living in our own resource our own wisdom our own intellect our own understanding our own powers yet we have the spirit of God with us now one of the most successful ways and here's what I, 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 I want to cut through one of the most successful ways the devil's caused believers to second guess their feeling has been through the argument of this little thing called tongues tongues do you need to speak in tongues in order to be filled with the spirit let me give you a crash course on why i believe biblically you don't let me give you a crash course first corinthians chapter 12 verse 28 paul writes this to the corinthians and god has appointed these in the church first apostles second prophets third teachers after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. The NIV says different kinds of tongues. Right? So I want you to see something there. Straight away, what Paul is saying when it comes to this thing called tongues, he says there are different kinds. 
So it's not just one size fits all. Sometimes when we think of this, people talk about tongues, we have a one-dimensional view, this is what it is. But Paul's saying here, there are various kinds of this gift, whatever it is, and, and don't run ahead of yourself, there are various kinds of this gift. Can everyone see that? There are varieties of tongues, not just one tongue, there are varieties of different kinds of expressions of whatever this thing called tongues is. So Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, there are varieties of tongues, different kinds of tongues, and go to 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1 to 2. And Paul says this, Pursue love, desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak, catch this, does not speak to men, but to God. Watch this, for no one understands him. Everyone say that, no one understands him. No one understands him. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. No one understands him. What he's describing there is one kind of the variety of tongues, right? There's that one variety that no one understands. I don't want to get into the nitty-gritty of it. I just want you to see something as we go on this journey. Various types of tongues. He describes one type there. It's a type that no one understands, right? Now, what I want us to do now is we're going to go into the book of Acts and we're going to have a look at each time that the Spirit was was, 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 was said to fill someone or be poured out upon someone. I'm going to give you a crash course in Acts before we, we go and, and have a look at what I want to get to. Acts chapter, four, Acts, Acts chapter 2 verse 4, it says that the Holy Spirit fell and they spoke in tongues. But remember the story. It says the Spirit fell and what did the crowd say? They said, what's going on here? How, how is it that we understand them in our language? In other words, this type of tongue, the crowd could understand that it. it was in human languages. Does that sound like the one that we just talked about? that no one understands? No. So straight away, we've got this picture biblically. There are two different types. Paul says there's varieties, different kinds. Well, here's one that he talks about in 1 Corinthians 14 that no one understands, only the Spirit. Here on the day of Pentecost, this tongue was understood by people who were standing around and they said this was human languages being spoken. Can you see that? It's human languages being spoken. It says tongues, but it was understandable. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 41, it says that 3,000 people were saved. They gave their life to Jesus as a result of Peter's message that he preached about Christ. Even though uh, 3,000 people were saved, but there's no mention of tongues at all. There's no mention that these 3,000 people burst into tongues. It doesn't say that. Even though we know they did receive the Spirit, because that's the same message that we just talked about where he said that uh, you know, if you repent and get baptized, then you receive the Spirit for you and the next generation, next generation, next generation. So we know they got the Spirit, but the author didn't feel any compulsion or need to mention that 3,000 people spoke in tongues that day. Interesting. Not every person in the, in the, in the book of Acts that, where it mentions their field, not every person is told that they had to speak in tongues. Now keep in mind, this is where most, this is where a lot of people, sorry, get their doctrine about this little gift called tongues. They get it from the book of Acts. So we're going through the book of Acts. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse 4. It says that 5,000 people were saved. There's zero mention of any tongues at all. 5,000 people, it makes it very clear. 5,000 people got saved. No mention of tongues. There's no emphasis or compulsion or need from the Holy Spirit or the author to mention tongues. Now, if they had have said on the day of Pentecost, these guys got tongues and spoke in different languages, then 3,000, they did too, then 5,000, you'd start to go, okay, let's build a case for this, theologically. But there's no mention of the 3,000, no mention of the 5,000. Acts chapter 8. We have the story where the gospel message goes to the Samaritans, and the Samaritans uh, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, something happened. We don't know what it is, but it says that, that the disciples were sent. When they heard that Samaria had received the word of God, the disciples went down to verify it. When they got there, they prayed for the Samaritans that the Holy Spirit would fall upon them, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. Now, it doesn't say anything. What it does say is that there was a sorcerer there named Simon who was working dark black magic. And when Simon saw, it says, when Simon saw that the Holy Spirit came by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he asked the apostles to buy it. I'll give you some money and you give me that gift. So we don't know what happened, but we do know that Simon saw something. There was something that he saw that made him go, wow, I want that power, I want that gift. We can assume potentially that maybe it was tongues. Maybe it was tongues, okay? Maybe it wasn't. Maybe they just fell over under the power of God. Maybe they were filled with the joy of the Lord and burst into laughter. Maybe they were delivered. We don't actually know, but a fair assumption theologically is that what they saw was most likely something related to tongues. Fast forward again. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 45. This is Cornelius' house when the gospel goes to Cornelius and Peter goes there. And it actually says that while Peter's preaching to them that the Holy Spirit falls upon them and they start speaking in other tongues. But interestingly, each time they speak in other tongues, the author explains what they were doing, speaking in other tongues and praising God. Now, if this is an unknown tongue, 
what we talked about in 1 Corinthians 14, how would you know what they were saying? So it obviously wasn't an unknown tongue. It was a language that they were listening to going, they're praising God, we know what they're doing. Fast forward to Acts chapter 19, it's the last time we see about this, this filling of the Spirit again. Same thing in Acts chapter 19. These people get prayed for, they get filled with the Spirit and, they, and it says that they began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. How did you know what they were saying in that language if it was an unintelligible language? So again, it's a language that the hearers, that, that somebody there knew what they were saying. Okay, they're, they're babbling, but, that, but we know what that is. They're praising God. How do you know that? It's because somebody there knows the language they're using. Just like on the day of Pentecost, spirit fell, they spoke another language. It wasn't just the, what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. So can you see that there are two different types of, 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 of this expression of the gift of tongues that the Word of God talks about? One is an unknown language that nobody understands. The one we see in the book of Acts seems to have been intelligible enough that they could say, they spoke in tongues and were praising God. Spoke in tongues and were prophesying. The one Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 14, he says they're speaking in a tongue, but we don't get it. Nobody understands it, only the Spirit. Two different expressions. Now, fast track. Here's what I want to talk to you about, the reason why. Why, why in the book of Acts do we have these significant moments where the Holy Spirit falls? And what is so important about this gift of tongues? There was something important about it. Now, I want you to keep in mind that the book of Acts is history. Okay? Can you get theology out of the book of Acts? Yes, you can. Because we can learn stuff about God in any book of the Bible. It doesn't matter what we read. But I want you to understand when Luke's writing the book of Acts, he's writing historically. How many of you know there are different genres in the, in the Bible? You know that? Like any book, you go to the library, there's different genres and different categories. There's poetry. Uh, uh, there's, there's, there's law. There's history. There's letters. And, and, and in the Word of God, it's no different. There are different genres of writings. And, and Acts comes into a genre of history. It's a, it's a history book. First 30 years of this movement called the church has been categorized and written down. Now, it doesn't mean we don't get doctrine from it. It doesn't mean you can't get theology from it. You can, but it's not written. Paul's not, Luke's not sitting down writing a theology curriculum. He's just documenting history and the significant parts of the growth of the church. Now, here's what I want you to see in regards to tongues. Why, why was, was tongues such an important part? Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Wake it up on the board for me. This is the basis as to why the rest of the expansion and these, this talking in tongues is such a big deal. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, we got it up there? Okay, watch this. You shall receive power. This is Jesus, right, speaking to his followers. And he says this, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me where? Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Then Samaria, then the outermost parts. So Jerusalem, Judea, if I can put it this way, the way that the Jews would have viewed that, Jerusalem, Judea, we're the full bloods. We're the full blood pucker Jews. That's who we are. That's Jerusalem, Judea. Samaria, we would be the half bloods. They would, they would consider them as kind of a half caste type of a, a, per, a person when it comes to being full on pucker Jew. The, 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 the Samaritans were considered half caste. And then the ends of the earth, they were no caste. These guys are not Jewish at all. They're not part of us. Okay, so keep that in mind. So what happens on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit falls where? In Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit falls in Jerusalem. What happens? They begin to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. But they're speaking in what? Languages and dialects that the crowd can understand. Keep in mind this is happening at a festival, one of the biggest Jewish festivals, where there are literally people from all the known world have come to Jerusalem. That's why there's so many languages going, we're hearing mean this, Egyptians, Arabs, Cretans, and so on. Let me read exactly what it says there. It says, they're all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews, this is Acts chapter 2, devout Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to each other, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamph Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. We hear them speaking in our own language the wonderful works of God. Here's the tongues. The tongues are Ill, uh, understandable to this crowd. So, so what I want you to do is realize that's the moment. This is the fulfillment of the prophet Joel. So we've been waiting for years for Joel to the spirit to be poured out on all flesh. Here it happens. So what do you think is going to be the marker for them to go to the next place and know that the Holy Spirit falls? What's the marker? 
What's the, what's, what's the marking point right there? The marking point right there is, okay, when the Spirit falls, this is what happens, you speak in tongues. This was the sign that we knew straight away that the Holy Spirit had fallen, we spoke in tongues. So I want you to be those 12 men, those 12 guys that are there birthing the church, going, okay, when the Spirit fell, this is what happened. Now fast forward. Fast forward with me from there, and let's go to the next time that tongues happens in Acts chapter 8. Where are we in Acts chapter 8? We're in Samaria. We've been from the full bloods, now we've gone to the half bloods. Now I want you to understand the animosity between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Jews and the Samaritans do not get on, they don't see eye to eye, and the Jews think we're here with God, you guys are down here, let alone Gentiles. And There's a hierarchy system. You're not a full blood Jew. God loves us. The theology of the Jews has been for centuries, God is our God, not yours. We are God's people, you're not. This is the theology that, that Luke's writing into. This is the mentality of the Jews, right? So God's going to have to do something pretty darn impressive and pretty, pretty to the point to get centuries of theology out of your brain to the point where you can acknowledge, because the church is starting here in Jerusalem, that you can acknowledge that God is embracing people who are not Jews. And so what happens in the book of Acts chapter 8, verse 14 to 18? It says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So here we go. Some guys have gone and preached in Samaria. A bunch of Samaritans have put their hand up in a meeting and said, Yes, I've decided to follow Jesus. But the Holy Spirit doesn't fall. So the apostles in Jerusalem, the ones that are kicking off this movement, they said, let's send a couple of our big wigs down there to check it out and make sure it's all right. So they did. They send them down. And when they get there, what happens? They get there and they see that they had received the word of God. It says they sent Peter and John to them, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So they didn't receive the Holy Spirit at that moment. Does that mean it's a second thing? Receiving the Spirit's a second thing? Well, that would go against everything else we've read. Right? But here we go. Keep in mind, this is the beginnings of the expansion of the church. This is the beginnings of the mission of the church. So they wait for Peter and John to be there. And when they came down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For, he, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered the money. So Simon saw something. There's a very good chance that what Simon saw was tongues. Why do you think that Peter and John had to go from Jerusalem to Samaria to verify these guys are receiving the same God that, 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 that we did? Because they're pillars of the church. They're the ones that are going to kick the whole thing off. So you need to have credible witnesses there when that moment happens. So God withholds the Spirit till those two guys are there as credible witnesses. Then he pours out the Spirit. What do you think they do? They go, oh, wow. God has given the same spirit to the Samaritans that he did to us. Maybe, maybe this whole Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria thing, this ends of the earth thing that Jesus talked about, maybe he was serious. So what do you think they do? They go back to Jerusalem and they've got to go, well, guess what? The Samaritans just received. How do you know that? Well, because you know that blibber blabber thing that we did. They were doing it too. <laughs> go figure. Can you see what's happening? There had to be apostles present to verify this thing that happened. So they could go back and go, no, no, God's expanding his borders. He's no longer just a Jewish God. We don't get it because we're the Gentiles. We're the, we're, the, we're the end of the spectrum. And so we, we, we know that we were grafted in. The, 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 the God of creation chose the Jewish people originally to create, to, to sort of reveal himself through human history. Then he expanded to us. We weren't the starting point. We were the end game. But to the guys who were the starting point, this is phenomenal. This is absolutely phenomenal, and I'll show you again. So here we are. We've gone from Jerusalem, Judea. Now we've gone to Samaria. Now the next step is we've got to take this to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 10, verse 44 to 45. Peter is on the, on the roof one day, and he's praying. He has a vision. Everyone remember the vision? A big sheep with all these animals that good Jewish boys don't touch. And the corner gets lowered down, and these animals run down. And God says to Peter, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 no. Good Jewish boys, we don't do that stuff, God, sorry. And God goes three times, lowers the corner, says, kill and eat. Pete, Pete goes, no, God. Can you imagine that? God says three times it's okay, and three times he says, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not. And then he gets a knock at the door, goes downstairs, gets led away to this guy called Cornelius, who's a Gentile. Goes down to Cornelius' house and watch what happens. It says in Acts 10, 44, 45, while Peter was still speaking these words, what were the words? He was explaining the vision. He said, you know what? Here's the deal. Uh, uh, I thought that I wasn't going to come to you guys and I had this vision. Now I know that God's, God's saying it's okay to be with you unclean, scabby people, um, but I'm going to do it anyway because I believe that God might be saying this is okay. This is a radical thing. Again, keep in mind, this is radical for the time, but watch what happens. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. 
And those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. They were amazed. Those who were good old Jewish boys were going, Oh, I can't believe this is happening because my theology for my whole life has been that God doesn't touch these types of people. He comes for us. Can you see how they're having to expand their thinking and embrace the world as Jesus tried to tell them? You're going to get the spirit. You're going to go Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outermost parts. To us, it just sounds like locations. To them, it's a complete change of worldview. It's earth-shattering for these people. They say, so it says that uh, because as many as uh, the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them, what? Speak with tongues and magnify God. So again, it's not a 1 Corinthians 14 tongue where no one gets it. They said, these guys spoke in tongues. We know what they were saying. They were magnifying God. So what is it? It's exactly the same experience that happened on the day of Pentecost. So you can see where God has taken them on a journey from Jerusalem, Judea. Then he's had to take them to Samaria, knock some walls down. Then he's taken them to the ends of the earth, knock some walls down. How do we know that was the process? Go to Acts chapter 11 and watch what happens when Peter goes back from this incident and reports it to the church. Where? Back in Jerusalem. Back to the power brokers, back to the place where this whole movement that you and I are a part of was being birthed out of. And here's the thing. Now, in, in Acts chapter 11, 1 to 18... Now, the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Okay, it's one thing that they received the word of God, but has the God of the word received them? That's the real question they're asking. They can say, yeah, they, they, can say, yeah, they agree with, with but, but is God going to accept them? This is the big question. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him and said, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. This is years after the resurrection of Christ, and the church is still talking like this. The uncircumcised men, you went in with them. This is disgusting. It's, it's just hard to break some of those cultural mentalities, isn't it? And as I began to speak, he says, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And here's the conclusion. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was, who was I that I could withstand God? And when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, then God also has granted the Gentiles repentance unto life. How would they have known that with the Samaritans? How would they have known that the Gentiles had the same experience they had unless there was not something tangible, a visible piece of evidence? Here's what I want you to think about when it comes to tongues. According to the book of Acts, tongues is not the only sign of being filled with the Spirit. I could give you other passages where people were filled with the Spirit, spoke the word with boldness, filled with the Spirit, prophesied, filled with the Spirit and served, filled with the Spirit and exercised spiritual authority. But to labor on this thing of tongues, that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not filled with the Spirit. It's not biblical. It's not theological. It's not correct. It's not correct. The purpose of tongues in the book of Acts was missional, not theological. It's missional. It's showing how God went from a group of people that had centuries and centuries and centuries of theology behind them that told them we are God's exclusive people and he doesn't touch those people. God had to give them something so evidential that they could look and go, that experience there, it was exclusive to what happened to us back here and what happened with the Samaritans. Can you see how God was just expanding his borders and getting to a point where people like you and me could one day bow our knee to God and say, thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. That was for me too. Amen? Amen. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? So here's, here's what I want to say to you. Don't get caught up on tongues. Is tongues a gift from God to his, to his people? Yes, I believe it is. It's relevant for today, definitely. It's still a very real gift. But if you don't speak in tongues, is that a reason to believe you don't have the Holy Spirit? No, it's not a case for that. Okay, And I want you to walk out of here whether you speak in tongues or you don't. And I want you to know that when you leave this place today, I want you to know, according, I mean, you can continue to believe that you're not if you want to. But let me tell you this. If you walk out of here still questioning whether you're filled with the Spirit, one of two things. Either you have never repented and given your life to Christ, or two, you're choosing not to believe what these documents say. You are filled with the Spirit. Uh, I might get the musos back. We're about to finish up. Get the musos back. We'll finish up. <laughs> Paul says in... In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, he says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. 
In other words, you all don't speak in tongues, but I wish you did. And he's writing this to believers. Not every believer has that gift upon their life. All believers have gifts. We have various and different gifts. But don't get caught up on this one gift as an evidence of being filled with the Spirit because it's not a, it's not a biblical doctrine that stands up under close scrutiny. Okay? If you have repented and turned your life over to Jesus and made a decision with your own free will that you're not going to live for yourself anymore, you're going to live for God. And if you've actioned that and, 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 and made that choice, put your faith in Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you are signed, sealed, delivered. You have received the Holy Spirit from heaven, from God to you. It's there right now. Let's start living like that's a reality. Don't wait till you feel like it. If you wait till you feel like it, you'll probably never start walking.